Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, my guest this week is the author and journalist David Goodhart. David was the founder of Prospect magazine back in the 1990s. He's now head of demography, immigration and integration at the policy exchange think tank. But he's perhaps best known to a wider audience uh, through two books. The first one called The British Dream, which was about the experience of immigration in Britain in the post-war period. And the second one, this one here, The Road to Somewhere, which came out a while ago, which is basically a description of the two tribes who exist now quite uneasily maybe uh, in Britain of anywheres and somewheres. He describes himself as post-liberal, and he's with me now. Uh, thank you very much, David. Mm. Post-liberal, uh, that doesn't immediately equal conservative, does it? No, it doesn't. Um, <clears throat> I don't actually use the term <laughs> very often because um, because it is a bit confusing and requires lengthy explanation. But yes. I guess it is um, it is partly saying um, that one can absorb many of the kind of fundamental um, truths um, and pronouncements of modern liberalism. I mean, the, the basics, kind of you know, rule of law separation of powers, individual rights, yeah. minority rights, etc. Um, one can accept much of that, all of that, um, and one um, can also see many of the, the kind of limits of contemporary liberalism, or indeed the unintended consequences, the, um, the kind of overreach of of con uh, contemporary liberalism, liberalism in another sense, beyond that, those kind of fundamental um, rules or principles of of modern liberalism, you know, since the 18th century, as it were. Um, um, and I would certainly, um, and it's all there's an element of sort of beyond left and right about it as well. Yeah. I think, uh, and that is indeed that's how I started writing the Road to Somewhere. I was, uh, I was, um, I'd originally. Um, Sort of the original plan was to write a book that was much more philosophical, was much more about beyond left and right, and indeed about sort of post, you know, what actually is post liberalism. Uh, but then I was just in the foothills of, of writing it when the Brexit vote happened mm, mm. Uh, unexpectedly. Um, and so I ended up writing something that was perhaps a, a little bit more um, sort of political with a capital P, a attempting to understand. Um, both the Brexit vote and in, indeed the the writing of the book was sort of bookended by the these two dramatic events of 2016, the Brexit vote and then Trump's election in November, mm. which was just just when I was finishing writing. Um, so I ended up writing something that was m trying to get under the skin of those events and to try and understand them through the value divides that have emerged to to you know at, to sort of in some way sort of challenge the, the traditional socio-economic divides or cut across anyway mm. um, um, but yes yeah, so, so I suppose I mean post-liberalism is post-liberalism is saying look you know <laughs> um, you know I, I, I am we are uh, you know still liberals in a fundamental way we're not um, um, we're not conservatives um, but we also perhaps share some of the reservations of conservatives about the direction of, of contemporary liberal mm. society. Um, um, I mean, I think it's um, it's a, it's it's not a it's not a phrase that's ever going to catch on, really. And and there are oh, I don't know. Par partly <laughs> part, well, partly because there are so many different potential definitions yeah. of it too. So it's in some ways not. You know, I mean, you know, I haven't even I haven't really explained it very clearly in you know in the last two or three minutes. But um, but it. I mean, you know, it's one of those. Yeah. I mean, th there is a family resemblance between, you know, between the people that that would mm. that would call themselves post-liberal. I guess. I suppose I took it maybe in a more uh, crude sense, if you mm. like. You talked, or you wrote an article, "How I Left My London Liberal Tribe," for example, mm. um, and I think that's how most people understand it. I mean, for those who maybe are not so aware, you. Mm wrote a, a famous article in, in, in Prospect, now famous I'd say, called Too Diverse, did you not? Question mark, yeah. yeah, to, in, uh, yeah. 2004. Yeah. And this seemed to be a sort of break for you possibly from 
the position you might have had then, and looking mm. more critically at, for example, the effects of immigration when it came to welfare state, when it came to cohesion. Yeah, yeah. And you were therefore moving away maybe from your habitat, as it were. No, indeed, yeah. I mean, I, I, I was a sort of, uh, kind of in this rather innocent, sort of unthinking, um, I didn't think I was unthinking, I thought I was terribly thoughtful, but I was basically kind of innocent, unthinking, centre, well, liberal lefty. Um, um, I, when I set up Prospect in the mid-1990s, we were generally seen as a pretty liberal magazine. Um, um, although I think we, all, we always sort of had a, there was always quite a strong contrarian streak in it too, um, you know, challenging some of the shibboleths of contemporary uh, liberalism. Um, yeah, and then I, I kind of stumbled by accident, really, into the whole area of race and immigration and multiculturalism by writing this rather, rather abstract um, 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 essay, five or six thousand word essay on the tension between diversity and solidarity, which seemed to me the sort mm -hmm. of one of the central issues for the modern centre left, which, which um, you know, you know, which which admires um, and um, wants to further both of these principles. These two principles are kind of at the heart of the modern left, you might even say. And clearly, they are in tension with each other. You know, that it, based on the common sense assumption that people are more likely to share with people with whom they have something in common. You know, they don't mm. have to look the same or pray to the same God even, but uh, you have to have some shared experience, trust, familiarity for uh, high levels of sharing to be mm. possible in a society. Um, and it's, that just seemed to me obvious, and I sort of just looked at some of the evidence for that in recent history. Um, and now, you know, these, these things are not inevitable and unavoidable. You can mitigate these tensions, um, but you've got to be aware of them and you've got to talk about them. Mm. Um, and um, uh, uh, and uh, the the, the essay was reprinted, all 6,000 words of it was reprinted in The Guardian. I mean, that's what mm. drew it to, to mm. a degree of national attention. Uh, and that caused, a, that caused quite an outcry. And, you know, I was accused of being a kind of nice racist or, um, yeah, you know, uh, all sorts of, um, all sorts of silly, silly phrases were, uh, were thrown around. But weren't uh, you sort of, in a way, considered a bit of an apostate, therefore, I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I think that's that was one of the reasons why. Yeah, I mean, you know, if somebody had written something like that in the Spectator, it would have, mm. you know, mm. no one would really have noticed. But yeah, it was the fact that it was coming from um, a magazine that was considered very loosely part of the sort of centre leftish. You know, we'd supported Blair in '97. We'd been quite critical of him over, over quite a few things subsequently, but um, we were generally considered. You, you know, I got invited to those kinds of parties. You know. Yes, yes, um, yes. Uh, Did you stop getting invited to things? No, well, it, there was a, uh, not immediately. I mean, actually, what was much more um, uh, memorable uh, uh, at the time, I remember, was lots of um, Labour MPs sort of saying quietly, sort of keep up the good work. You've yes, got to keep talking yes, about these things. Yes. Um, uh, but very sort of voce. Um, yeah. And um, and yeah, in a way, rather sort of hypocritically. Um, but um, I guess it was, you know, e even as recently as two thousand and four, it was quite difficult. You know, if you did question um, high levels of immigration, you know, there, there was something slightly suspect, slightly yeah, sinister yeah, about you. Yeah. Um, I mean, it really was that bad. I mean, I, th I think it's changed quite a lot since then. I mean, we, p partly because of the experience of, of free movement from the former communist countries, you know, we, we've had a, you know, a, much of the immigration since then has been from Central and Eastern Europe, people who are, you know, white and Christian and so on. So it's, it's been easier to sort of to, to talk about the, the negative economic or indeed cultural impact of large scale immigration without it without it being so attached to race. I mean, obviously one of the reasons why um, yeah, the, the immigration was so sensitive is because race is so sensitive. And, and particularly, and, and also one of the reasons why the left found it so hard to think clearly about immigration is because 
um, you know, one one of the great sort of achievements you might say of the modern left is to is to is the anti-racist achievement, you know, def, you know defending minorities against um, against discrimination. Um, and the left is on the whole, in most countries, has been responsible for the for pioneering anti-discrimination legislation and so on. Um, and you know, and those are good things that the left can be proud of. But it's mm. um, partly because these these are such um, be because you know, the, 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 as a result of that, the left thought that it owned the, the whole issue of race. Mm. Really, um, that they were the only people who were who thought decent thoughts about race, and therefore they were the only people who were mm. entitled to mm. to a view on it. Um, and the way that race got sort of entangled with immigration, obviously the two things are completely separate logically, um, but the way in which you know that, that if you were in favour of of slowing immigration or restricting it in some way, then you were somehow um, someone who didn't didn't like people from different races. Yeah, I mean, you know, it was yeah, as kind of yeah, silly yeah. as that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, and it's taken the left, I think, a long and even now. I mean, it, there's a sort of unthinking bias in favour of large scale immigration, which is so ridiculously and obviously in conflict with the economic interests of the left, or you know, or the or the people that the left has traditionally been there to defend. I mean, the whole, you know, what, why is it called the Labour Party? Because it was set up in order mm. to defend the interests of organised labour. Mm. What, it, what, is it, what is against the interests of organised labour? Vast numbers of people coming in from mm. other countries, mm. you know. It, mm. it was, mm. yeah, um, you know, Marx talked about the, um, um, the Reserve Army of Labour. Mm. You know, in Marx's day, the Reserve Army of Labour came from Ireland. Yes. Now it comes from Central and Eastern Europe. Um, you see, you said uh, that uh, it was still considered slightly sinister even to talk really very much about migration in 2004. Mm. Yeah. Uh, problem is, though, my perception, I think the perception of a lot of people, is that now immigration as a subject has sort of gone again. It, it's, mm. You say it's easier. I'm not sure because, first of all, it's not talked about very much, I would say. And then, secondly, on, on top of that, the mass immigration as opposed to just what you might call immigration mm. has become normalized so, so to the extent that say two to three hundred thousand mm. i think this was even uh, pointed out when you were writing your book was that two hundred thousand to, to many on the left seems like quite normal i, yeah. I would say that's not normal would you no no i, I agree um and it's had I mean, a lot more. I mean, I that. think it has. Uh, I, I think we. I think we do talk about immigration quite a lot now. I mean, just actually in the last few months, the whole the whole sort of subject has died down. I think. I think partly because of Brexit. Partly because people think, well, you know, at last we are going to yeah, yeah. be back in control of mm. uh, of all forms of immigration. Mm. I mean, uh, there remains a bit of a question mark over that. Um, it's true, but um, uh, I mean, I think uh, aside from that recent lull. Um, I mean, in, in a sense, it's sort of justified lulling concern. Um, I think we do talk about it quite a lot, um, and certainly, certainly, um, you know, and, and we talk about it in quite sort of you know gritty detail. You know, I mean, you know, but do politicians? Politicians don't. I think they do. I mean, you know, we had a we had a government white paper at the end of last year, or we have arguments about whether you know should there be a kind mm. of thirty grand a year. Um, limit, you know, how, you know, how do we bear down on low-skill immigration, but continue to have, you know, moderately high flows of skilled immigration? Is that the right way to go? We have the Migration Advisory Committee, which I think is a, which has proved a, a, a great innovation actually, and they are um, often very, very critical of more um, kind of neoliberal and indeed, you know, leftish ways of thinking. I mean laissez-faire ways of thinking about immigration. They're very critical of employers and the way that employers have, um, um, you know, have, have just reached for, for immigration as a way to sort of solve their skill shortages and so on. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's astonishing. And one of, the few, one of the sort of social facts that is, is far less well known than it should be is just how uh, there's a guy called uh, Francis Green at UCL who tracks these things that there are lots of government surveys that support what he's saying that since 2000 I mean since well since the late 1990s actually uh, and, and particularly since 2004 five 
um, the amount of um, money that employers spend on training has declined, but I think it's ending between 20 and 25 percent. The amount of time that you know, that, that um, sort of per head um, people spend being trained mm -hmm. has declined by 50 percent. I think some enormous figure, um, and this should be more more prominently um, discussed in in the public debate. I mean, I think uh, I think employers have had um, a, you know. A, a free lunch over, over free movement. But in a way there's been a strange sort of alliance, hasn't there, between what employers want in yeah. terms of the cheap labour and also what the left wanted mm. in terms of pure, mm. as it were, you know, the whole rubbing their nose in diversity argument. The, yeah. the, the two who sort of came together almost, did they not? Yeah, yeah. You find and them on the same platform almost. Yeah, and it's, it's you know, it's, it's the double liberalism, you know, it's the double liberalism that in some ways the Modern political discontents represented by Brexit and Trump have been in revolt against. You know the, mm. the 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 liberalism of free market economics and the belief that free trade must you know, un, you know unconstrained free trade must always be a good thing, um, and the social liberal social and cultural liberalism, one of which you know one of which uh, one of the most prominent aspects of which has been um, you know high flows of people across borders. Um, and you know, general comfort with, and sort of support for rapid social change and social fluidity, which you know, to use my language in the kind of language of anywheres and somewheres. I mean, you know, anywheres who completely dominate our society, economy, culture, politics, um, despite only being 25, 30 percent of the population, possibly. Um, I mean, these are not hard and you know, there are sort of fuzzy borders around these things. We're talking about world views. You know, not everybody. You know, signs up to the full, full kind of anywhere or somewhere worldview, um, but 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 you know, anywhere people tend to have what I call achieved identities. Their sense of themselves comes from the fact they passed exams when they were young. Mm -hmm. They went to more or less good universities. Mm -hmm. They had they had more or less successful professional careers. They're mobile. They're often very individualistic, even if they're on the left, um, and they're comfortable with social change. They tend to have weak group attachments. Uh, and a, a relatively weak attachments to place. They, they may, they, you know, they, they, you know, even if they don't live where they came from, they will still, you know, as as many people who felt uncomfortable, who didn't like my book, would say, but you know, I live in Stoke Newington, I'm very attached to it. And of course, they are. I mean, um, I, I don't contest that for one moment. It isn't the places they originally came from, but they've, you know, they've ended up in, yeah, 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 in yeah, somewhere yeah. that they that they feel strong. Uh, community attachment to, but that is sort of somewhat different, I think, to feeling an attachment to the place you originally came from. Mm -hmm. um, in any case, you know, the, the those attachments are much weaker, I think, on the part of highly educated people, partly because they have been they have been mobile and they're um, they're you know they're they're attached to kind of looser networks of people with you know who have who with shared you know, who share their views about things. Um, and are you know are comfortable with social change, um, and that's the point. And and there are a great many people in our society who, who you know, people who have more ascribed identities, whose sense of themselves comes from group attachment and attachment to place, um, who who don't feel that same comfort. And if if you have a if you have an identity that is sort of built around group and place, then it is much more subject to being. Um, Disrupted or discomforted by by social change. I mean, these have seemed pretty obvious things, um, and, um, and and they you know they should be you know what we talk about in our politics. Mm. We're sort of talking about them now, I suppose, anyways and somewheres, uh, because of Brexit. But how long have these, if you would call these groups, these tribes, one much smaller than the other, the anywheres? Mm although much more influential. How long had they been in existence before Brexit? I mean, Brexit kind of revealed them. I remember there was just an anecdote in one of your books, in the British Dream book, about people you were having dinner at some function with, you know, pretty top, top brass civil servant, I believe, and an academic. And there you relate how their whole approach to the world was entirely global. It was that they, they, had, they felt they had an obligation to people yeah, yeah, just yeah. as strong in other countries as to here. You know, that 
they would be, I suppose, classic anywheres, would they not? Uh, extreme anywheres, yes. I mean, I actually named them. I mean, I, I, I used the uh, anecdote twice. I used it in the British Dream, but um, um, the civil servant in particular was still, I think, um, head of the civil service at the time, so I didn't actually name him. I did name them both in um, in the road to somewhere. It was Gus O'Donnell. Mm. Gus O'Don I was sitting next to Gus O'Donnell at a dinner at Nuffield College, and he, um, I said I was writing a book, a book about immigration, and he said, oh, well, you know, when I was at the Treasury, I was always in favour of kind of, um, you know, as as much immigration as possible. Um, and we sort of talked a bit further, and he and he came out with what I thought was an absolutely astonishing thing to say, particularly if you're head of the National Civil Service, which is that. Um, you know, I believe in maximising global welfare, not national welfare. Mm, mm. Um, and um, uh, and I happen to be sitting <laughs> that the uh, the man to my left um, was all, these were probably the two most powerful unelected people in Britain at the time, uh, Gus O'Donnell, and to my left was Mark Thompson, who was then head of the BBC. And I said to Mark, "Did you just hear that? You know, the head of the National Civil Service just said that he thought it was his job to maximise global welfare." Um, and um, and Mark Thompson said, oh, well, 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 I agree with him, of course. You know. um, and um, and uh, that <laughs> that sort of I think was one of the kind of inspirations for writing both of my books, actually, in a way. But uh, it is extraordinary because these these people are hugely high up, very emblematic of that attitude. Uh, in some ways, surely, you know, Brexit was a revolt against that. And the, the, the anger, which has been now directed, I would say, mm. at Brexiteers, comes from th that sort of attitude and people feeling, you know, actually they've had their way for a very long time and they're just angry that somehow it's being challenged in some way. You, you mean the Remainers? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you are a Remainer yourself, are you not? I, I mean, voted Remain, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, I think we should respect the vote. Uh, I think we should leave the European Union. Um, but yeah, I mean, I voted. I mean, largely for sort of for reasons of sort of small c conservatism in a way. I mean, everybody was voting in a way for reasons of small yeah, c conservatism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, but yes, I think it, it is slightly depressing the way in which um, the you know the, the political class has sort of has you know which is what sort of seventy percent remain, um, if not more. Uh, certainly, Parliament is you know has. Uh, I do think it's it is very I mean I think what has happened like, obviously what has happened has been partly determined by the fact that the government has not had a a majority in in the in parliament mm. um but there is a sort of deeper there's something sort of more deeply depressing about it I mean I think it really is the sort of be careful what you wish for that we have spent so much of the last 30 years or so talking about expanding the boundaries of individual freedom about um, about um, about welcoming diversity, about um, feeling you know happy that that we are in a way becoming a more fragmented and pluralistic society. That you know we pursue different different faiths, we have different different values, um, and yet still more or less manage to kind of live together more or less peacefully. Um, and yet it has clearly taken its toll. The fact that on something as important as this, we have not been able to, uh, you know, that the different sort of factions in Parliament have not been able to um, submerge or suspend their differences for the greater common good. The fact that we haven't been able to work out what the common good mm, is, mm. Um, I think it shows that there's, there's been a sort of draining away of that, um, both of the sort of almost the kind of technical ability to come to compromises, um, you know, everyone has been sort of head down pursuing their own narrow goal um, and not looking up and and deciding what, you know, and fashioning fashioning a decent compromise that that takes us out of the European Union, but, but in a way that is not, you know, so alienating for the 48% of the population that, that voted to remain. Um, and I think, um, yes, I think it is it is a it is a rather depressing sign of the times that that mm. that that sort of collective sort of intuition almost to to, to come together over to, to and and find a common good you know has has just become weakened. You know the uh, 
attitudes that you're describing amongst, I mean, those are, those are very particular versions of it, of, of anywheres. Uh, you have anywheres, you have somewheres. But isn't there also another tribe, maybe even smaller, what you might call nowheres? These are people, it seems to me, who don't really care very much about the European Union. They're not really, but they just, they have a kind of strange nihilism about Britain and about the nation state generally, I sort of a, a dislike. They would be happy to reduce it in any way, but they're but they're they're not especially, mm. you know, European. They will say they are, but it's a kind of strange. It's this this kind of self hate that goes through much of European society now. Yeah, I, I think I think it's true. I mean, I think there's been a, um, you know, in in the modern academy there is a very um, very strong liberal left um, hegemony in many mm. uh, many humanities and social science departments um, and um, I think that is partly to do with um, hostility to um, the domination of you know we come from a country that has been dominant in global terms, uh, at least until a few decades ago, you know, was, was one of the leading countries, if not the leading country in the world for, for a couple of hundred years. Um, and, you know, and modern democratic, egalitarian um, you know, ideas of equality, both in social class, in ethnic terms and so on, um, you know, look back on our recent history and feel dismayed at that degree of domination. You know, the, the, the domination of one group over another is, um, um, you know, is is seen as as a as a kind of wound. You know, the empire, um, you know, is is seen as a as as an as a as a ghastly mistake. And, and obviously, that is judging the past by the standards of the present. But doesn't it go, sorry David, doesn't it go mm. further than that? In the sense, you know, if you go back, I know it's a very hoary old, old, old quotation, you know, Orwell said about the English intelligentsia having a kind of distaste mm. for England, for their nationality. He said it was almost unique in that. Now, that seems to be quite separate to guilt about empire. Uh, well, there was always, there was always a... Um, there was always a sort of small segment, often of the kind of educated classes, who were in a sort of um, permanent revolt against the empire. And, and actually, I think one has to, you know, it's almost the, the sort of, you know, families like Jeremy Corbyn's. You know, his fa parents famously met on a on a kind of anti-Franco demonstration in the 1930s. You know, they were the people that, that who sort of they were the liberal conscience of empire in a way. You know, those people going back a couple of hundred years, and 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 I think you know, sort of good on them in some ways. Um, you know, they were responsible for some of the, um, you know, bringing some of the, you know, for, for exposing some of the worst atrocities or brutalities of empire. And um, I don't think they they aren't the problem really. I don't think. Um, I mean, they were they were partly trying to hold the empire to a to a kind of higher liberal standard. Um, now, I mean, yeah, it's true. I mean, they're you know what Orwell was talking about. I mean, he was you know probably talking about people who were kind of members of the Communist Party in the 1930s or on the fringes of it. Mm. I, mean, I mean, just to go back to, to Gus O'Donnell and Mark Thompson, I mean, they're, they're, I mean, you know, there are lots of different kinds of anywheres, um, as indeed there are lots of different kinds of somewheres. There are huge gradations, and there's a big in-between a group, well, about 25% of the population. When I say in-between, I mean people who sort of share almost equally the sort of anywhere and somewhere worldviews. Um, I mean, I think there is there is a uh, the kind of more extreme anywhere end represented by the sort of Gus O'Donnell, Mark Thompson view. You know, those sort of citizens of nowhere. You know, in, mm, yes, in Theresa yes. May's famous speech, people who are genuinely, you know, v very very globally minded, spend their lives in in you know airport lounges and mm. and probably have more sort of you know connections internationally than they do. Uh, and, and, and feel really quite a weak attachment to, the, to their own countries often. Um, um, but they're a very, they're a pretty small number. I mean, m you know, most anywheres have kind of normal, moderate national feeling, I would, I would say. I mean, they're, you know, they're not perhaps as patriotic as many more rooted 
somewheres, and also, of course, national social contracts matter a lot more often to poorer people and people who feel they have relatively less sort of sovereignty in their own in yeah. their own lives. I think often are sort of comforted by the fact that actually there are kind of levers, you know, there in London that can be pulled and things happen. Um, David, the mm. anywheres that we're talking about, they are to a great extent in charge of the cultural direction we take. They, I would say, are tend to be characterised by basically feeling this guilt that we discussed or not being particularly proud. Now, the fact is, if you're getting or trying to get people to integrate into that, how do you do it if those people who are in charge of that don't even really believe in it themselves? How can you convince people to integrate? Mm, this is the, mm. you, you, you're you working in integration at the yeah. moment in policy. Yeah, no, I mean, how, you're right. How do you I mean, do I, this? I, I go to lots of seminars where people essentially say, well, you know, what is there to integrate into? Yes. You know, yes. um, this is the where it's, it's in cultural and social matters, the left is often espousing a kind of Thatcherite, there is no such thing as society. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you, you know, you say, you know, that, 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 you know, why can't we have another, you know, 200,000 people from Afghanistan? Because, you know, we're all just individuals, aren't we? You know, they can mm, just sort mm, of, you mm. know, so long as we provide them with sufficient housing and education, it'll all be fine. Um, they are sort of a culturalist, you might say. They don't believe that, 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 that societies have distinct flavours and characteristics and cultures. Um, and yeah, it, it is part of the sort of liberal individualism of, of the left um, when, it, when it comes to these issues of integration and immigration and so on. Um, they remain collectivist often in, in, in economics, but, but sort of individualist um, uh, and liberal in, in cultural and social matters. Um, I mean, integration is an incredibly difficult and sort of slippery concept. Um, it's an extremely difficult thing to, you, you know, you can't enforce integration in a liberal society. And indeed, you know, there is such a thing as, um, what's it called, the technical term is homophily, you know, that, that people often do feel more comfortable amongst people like themselves, whether they're from the ethnic majority or ethnic minorities. Um, you know, the, this, is, this is very well known. I mean, you can observe it every day. Um, um, but a society it, which, um, which, you know, fragmented into just, you know, lots and lots of separate groups would not be a very healthy one. So we need to acknowledge both the kind of reality of um, you know, people feel, feeling often feeling more comfortable amongst people like themselves with the desire to cross these ethnic and class and other boundaries uh, as much as possible to have a society. There's a very nice way of putting it um, that um, a colleague of mine, Philip Wood, came up with, which is a, a, a well-integrated society is one in which everybody is a potential friend. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that's, a, that's a rather a nice, vivid way of putting it. Uh, and I think we're a very, very long way from that kind of society. Um, and integration becomes more difficult when you have um, serious critical mass for different minorities, particularly minorities from more traditional countries with much more collectivist and authoritarian instincts than, than the kind of liberal individualistic uh, instincts of the majority culture, but also there's here. no, there, but there's no, there's no need to integrate if you have, in such numbers, there is no, surely no need. You have a ready-made community. This is the problem, isn't it? Is that to, mm. in, one thing follows another. In order to have integration successfully, you've got to surely have smaller numbers of of, of migrants. Well, I mean that, that this is you know one of the reasons for arguing for. For, for more moderate levels of immigration, yes, yeah. it's easier to absorb people. Um, you know, if, if you have the, if there aren't so many of them, and you, and you have a longer time to do it, mm. um, that was, that was often, the, often the case. You know, back in the, in the, in the sort of post-colonial immigration period, it was often easier to integrate people then because the numbers were, the numbers were lower. Um, but you mentioned, by the way, earlier when we were talking, um, before we came on air, about uh, the is it the, the Danish, uh, what they are doing. Yeah, I mean, I mean they they, they represent the kind of the most draconian 
uh, end of the spectrum. But I mean, I think quite a lot of what they're doing, we should certainly look at. I mean, it's you know, what are it, they doing? It, it's almost sort of Singaporean. I mean, you know, Singapore does not allow, um, uh, or rather, it, it enforces. Um, integration in, in in housing, particularly, you know, there there are sort of quotas. You know, you cannot have more than a certain proportion of of people from a certain background in a particular housing estate, mm -hmm. for example. The Danes, I think, are doing something similar um, in in neighbourhoods. Uh, they're enforcing very very strict rules in schools. So they are basically saying we are not going to have, as we you know, we have many schools where. Uh, you know, 90% of the children. You know, if you go to Tower Hamlets or wherever, 90% of the children will be will be Bangladeshi background. You know, you go, you know, a, a few miles away, it'll be 95% will be will be white British. I mean, the Danes are saying we're not having that. You know, we are going to um, we're going to make sure that um, you know we spread out the minority kids. So that there, you know, that there is never going to be more than a third. I think I, mm. I, I'm not quite sure what the exact figure is, but no more than a third in any particular class. Yeah. Um, now, I mean, that's um, you know, given that that minorities often concentrate together. I mean, that rec probably requires, you know, quite a logistical effort in moving people around. Um, but they're prepared to invest in it. Um, you know, the, the Danes are, are, are very worried about these things, even though their their immigration numbers have come. Have, uh, have come down a lot and are rel rel relatively low now. They are they're being very very tough-minded about it, um, and you know and people who are who are saying they don't want to comply with these rules are saying right well you're not getting any welfare benefits. I mean they're right, right, you know right. very you know, tough-minded in a way that um, probably relatively few other European societies would be at the moment. But how, when it comes to integration, the, it, it, you're talking very practical measures there, i.e. dispersing yeah. people. When it actually comes to the actual culture, m making people integrate into that, the, the moral code, the social code, all of these things, how are they dealing with that in Denmark? I mean... I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm not an expert on the, on the Danish story. Um, this is where but all the flashpoints seem to be happening more and more here. I mean, yeah. with the case in Birmingham, for example, and the parents in Birmingham, mm. and this sort of th these areas. These yeah, are the ones I, that I agree. I mean, that that is a uh, you know a, a fascinating example of you know you know be careful what you wish for. This is what this is what it's like living in a multicultural society. Yeah, you know, yeah. in a sense, you have to allow conservative Muslims to object to uh, homosexuality being taught in schools. I mean, <laughs> I mean that is um, you know that is their right. In a liberal society, I mean, they they shouldn't win the argument. Um, I do think we need to. I mean, the whole British values thing I find a bit clunky. Um, I would like there to perhaps be a bit more emphasis on teaching British history. Um, I mean, that also raises difficult issues. I mean, people, uh, you know, coming here from different countries, often countries that have been on the wrong end of the British Empire. But 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 none of, you know we still have the British Empire in common, um, and it's surely not not beyond the wit of man to teach the story of the British Empire relatively neutrally. Yes, there were awful things about it. There were there were there were good things about it. Um, you know we can we can teach these things surely in a relatively neutral and balanced way. Um, I mean I think so. You know shared history. You know, wanting people as it were to to kind of adopt. You know, adopt British history as their own when they come and live in a country. Perhaps not the first generation, but certainly by the second generation. I mean, but that I mean, which which, which doesn't mean to say. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, I'm not saying um, you know that we should all support the Tebbit test. I do think that it, it's possible for people to identify with the country in many different ways. And I think you know, people whose families have been here for thousands of years might identify with Britain or England in a different way to somebody who's, who's you know, just come over a generation or a couple of generations ago. Uh, they will identify perhaps more with the political freedoms, with the, with the economic wealth. With, but I, th I, mean, I think over time, we, you would hope that people become absorbed into that, you know, the kind of invisible Common norms and sort of shared historical references, you know, turning a blind eye, you know, the Dunkirk spirit, all of these mm -hmm. things that are that are sort of in our in our vocabulary that 
that that speak to our history. It's a it's a very it's a very nice idea, but um, I I can't help feel a bit skeptical about it simply because of the as I said the sheer the the, the numbers involved mean that this becomes very very difficult. But uh, well, are you? Are, we have to mm, finish now. Yeah. Know, but I mean, are you? Are you more, more optimistic now than maybe in two thousand and four on these issues, or less? Um, or no change. Um, I think we have a more open debate about it. I think we have. I mean, you know, I mean, I experienced in a sense how closed the debate was in two thousand and four. Um, personally. Um, I think we do have a more open and honest debate about these things. Um, uh, whether things are moving in a better direction, I mean, I think I think Brexit will have a, 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 a kind of a break effect, perhaps on. I mean, the, you know, the, the anywhere political classes have received a great shock, and I think they, I mean, despite their, well, you know, the sort of political petulance that has been on display, you might say, in, in recent weeks and months, I think there will be a recognition that, uh, that actually they were too oblivious of their own cultural and political domination mm. and that there will be some adjustment to that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably hopeful that that will take place, perhaps, perhaps a little bit too hopeful. Well, here's hoping anyway. Thank you very, very much, David. Thank All you. Right. Thanks very much for watching uh, So What You're Saying Is. Um, please do subscribe, as I say, every time. And um, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.